welcome back. Jen Lipsy, CEO of the Association of Child Life Professionals, returning with another video interview with the lovely Megan Kelly, who I will ask to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Megan Kelly, and I am the Director of Child Life and Patient and Family Services at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore in the Bronx, New York. I've been here for 21 years, so the Bronx is my home. Wow, 21 years. That is something definitely to be celebrated. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. You have seen a lot and you are no doubt living through a lot. Yes. Uh, right now, uh, April 28th, just to mark the day, April 28, 2020. Um, as you might know, I've been reaching out, trying to engage various members just to see how this whole pandemic is impacting them personally and professionally as they go about doing their um jobs as, well, not jobs, but roles as parent, partner, you know, provider, um, colleague. And I was especially interested, obviously, in your story, um, seeing your Facebook posts and that you have lived and are a survivor of the coronavirus. So I'm specifically interested in your personal story, uh, but then also evolve it into, you know, now that you're back at work, how it has informed your approach as a provider. Um, but if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you to just share from the moment at where you felt like symptoms coming on or what was that like? What's what's the trajectory there? Sure, sure. So back in the middle of March, uh, March 16th to be exact, I woke up feeling like I had allergies. Um, my sinuses were full. I had a bad headache, post-nasal drip. And I thought, okay, springtime in New York, here we go. Allergies are coming on. Uh -huh. So, you know, I got myself ready. I went into work and, um, you know, we had heard about this thing, coronavirus, you know, starting to come around, but they were really talking about very specific symptoms of, you know, chest pain and cough, a dry cough. At that point, they hadn't mentioned any other symptoms. So I wasn't connecting it at all. Um, and I came into work and got about halfway through my day and I started feeling really exhausted. And I came to my office and with my manager, um, we usually have lunch together and have our lunch meeting. And we sat down and we were having our lunch and talking. She's pregnant and was about to go out on maternity leave. And we had our lunch and um, my door was open and a nursing leader colleague came by to say hi. And she looked at me and said, you don't look that great. And I said, yeah, I'm having bad allergies today. And she said, why don't you let me take your temperature? And she went and got a thermometer and came back and took my temperature. And while I stood in my small office with the two of them, she told me I had a temp of 101.9 wow. and I needed to go home. So um, I called um, my OHS department. And at that point, they were only taking people that had been knowingly exposed to somebody with COVID in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So they advised me to go to an urgent care center, which I did. Um, and when I went in, the, the provider just had regular scrubs on, no particular protective equ equipment, just as if I was going on a regular office visit, and uh, took my history and said, you know, you might have a little RSV or maybe a touch mm -hmm. of the flu, mm -hmm. but um, I'm going to swab you for, you know, flu A, flu B, and COVID, just in case. Mm -hmm. And he left the room, came back in, completely gowned in PPE uh -huh. um, after he had just spent 20 minutes without it on, in the room with me and did all the swabs. Yeah. And the next day they called me and said, you don't have the flu. And I thought, uh-oh, if I don't have the flu, I might have that new thing, coronavirus. Um, and they told me it'd be three more days before I got those um, results. So that night, you know, when I went to bed, I sort of felt a little icky and tired and whatever, but I still wasn't thinking anything of it. And, um, you know, I, I communicated with a couple of friends, you know, I'm not feeling well, which is very unusual for me. I never, ever get sick. I never take sick days. I always have a full bank of time in my, in my uh, accruals at work. Yes. And so it was very surprising for everybody that Megan was home sick, you know. Right. By the next day... My fever was consistent. Um, I had the dry cough. I had a, 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 a kind of tightness that's not, um, I wasn't labored in my breathing and I didn't feel like my lungs didn't have any pain. I just felt like I can't quite catch my breath fully, you know, mm -hmm. it's very shallow. Um, I had horrible nausea. I couldn't eat anything at all. Um, 
and I had diarrhea. <laughs> so you, were you able to sleep that night? Or was oh, it like I did sleep? nothing but sleep. I slept. The fatigue was like something I've never experienced in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, the All of those symptoms, as I'm describing, went on for 10 full days without a break. Um, and so around day five, I started to really panic because I found out on day three that I had was positive. Mm-hmm. And then around day five, I started to really panic. Sure. Because I live alone. Right. And at that point, it was like, you know, a few days in and more people had started to get diagnosed in the New York area. Mm-hmm. And a friend of mine's husband had been homesick. And then she heard him gasping for breath during the night. She called 911 and he went into the hospital and was put on a ventilator. He's still in the hospital now. Um, He's off the ventilator, but he's still in the hospital. So in that moment when I was home alone, I'm thinking, there's nobody here to hear me gasping for breath. Mm -hmm. What what am I going to, what's going to happen? Yeah. If I can't breathe, they tell you on when the doctor called me, he said, if you have trouble breathing, call 911. And I thought, well, if I have trouble breathing, I'm going to die. And, yeah, right. You know, and and during that time when I was so fatigued and sick, there were moments where I would be laying in the bed and looking over at my end table where the Tylenol, a bottle of water was, and the pack of saltine crackers, which was the only thing I could tolerate. And I'd think to myself, I can't even roll over to get that Tylenol, open that bottle and take my medicine. Yeah. How am I going to call 911? You know, and at that point is when I went on social media and I let everybody know. Yeah. I need help. I need prayers. I need support. I need people checking on me. Yeah. And I told a few close friends that lived in my area, you know, if you text me and I don't text you back, call me. Mm -hmm. And if you call me and I don't answer the phone, come over to my apartment and knock on my bedroom window. Yeah. And if I don't answer that, call 911. Yeah. Probably should have told them to skip right to the 911 part. But I thought, you know, in case I'm sleeping, let me give them a couple of times to wake me up. Sure. Um, And so they did. You know, people called me and texted me and FaceTimed me. Um, And, uh, you know, if you've seen any of the Chris Cuomo segments that he's Mm -hmm. done on his show, he described it exactly. I was never so validated as when he started to do those segments. And I heard him talking about the experience in the same way I was living it at the same time as him. Right, right. Because before that, I thought, am I being overly dramatic about how I feel? Like, am I, am I exaggerating this in my head? Am I, you know, responding too much to this? And when I heard him talk about it, I realized, no, he's describing exactly what's happening to me. Yeah. You know, I lost 17 pounds the first week. That's insane. That is totally insane. Yeah. Um, You know, I would, my friend would call me on FaceTime and say, honey, just eat one saltine cracker. Just one while you're talking to me. Right. I would nibble away on that little cracker while I was talking to her. Um, You know, I had another friend that would call me every day and he would say, did you, did you make the ginger tea with the honey and lemon in it? You know, please, honey, just drink that. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, I have two cats, so I had to force myself to get up every day to feed my cats. Mm-hmm. Um, and I usually tried to combine that with one of my many trips to the bathroom. Sure. By the way, it's exactly 10 steps from my bedroom to my toilet. Right. <laughs> right. I would know because I would just Long be like, ten one steps. more step, Megan, right. just get to the toilet. And then I'd make that one trip a day to the kitchen to feed the cats. And that was it. And then I was just in bed sleeping and sleeping and sleeping with that fever nonstop and all those other um, issues nonstop. And then around day 10 or 11, I finally felt like, all right, I can get out of bed now, you know? Um, And I did document it with photos, as you saw on Facebook. I I documented, you know, every couple of days. I didn't get every day because some days I just couldn't manage it at all. But I tried to snap photos of myself so that I could document what it was like to go through that. Um, Once I got through that part of it, Uh, let me mention that while that was all going on, my manager who normally would be covering for me went out early, um, for her maternity leave. Uh So, and, and, and by the way, when I found out I was diagnosed, I was so concerned for her because she had been with me every day prior to my diagnosis. And she was seven months pregnant 
already having other um, issues with her pregnancy and knowing she was going to go out early. So I was so concerned that she would have caught it from me. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, she did not, mm -hmm. which was great. Um, but she went out early on her leave. So I was gone as director. The manager was gone as manager. And I am forever grateful to my senior child life specialist, Talia Habib, who stepped up into a leadership role like you could never expect somebody to step up into. Right. In the most urgent crisis time in the history of our program here, she stepped up and took charge. Awesome. And the rest of my team stepped up and responded to her as the leader. And it was so amazing to yeah. learn about once I came out of it, because I didn't right. really know um, to what extent that was happening. And, and then when I came out of it, to be able to talk with her, um, you know, and she would call me at home and, and, you know, we would, we would talk about different things and, you know, she's worked for me for 18 years. So I trusted whatever she was going to do. I knew it was going to be the right thing. Yeah. But I didn't have to worry about that. Um, but it was great to see that the whole team rallied around her. Absolutely. Um, and, and so I, I took, after my symptoms cleared, I had 72 hours free without um, those symptoms. Mm -hmm. And my boss, um, who's our AVP of um, nursing, Tara Buckemeyer, she said to me, um, she had also had it at the same time as I did, but she had a shorter um, time of it. She only had a few days mm -hmm. and she ended up staying out two weeks. So mm -hmm. she said, you need to stay another week just to rest because sure, there's sure. the symptom time when you're actually very, very sick. And then you need the recovery time to build right. your strength back up and your stamina. And so I planned to stay home another week, which I did. And I was communicating with my team and we did one uh, Zoom meeting where we did a self-care activity together um, and talked about what was happening in the program. And then I was set to go back um, on a Monday and, and a Sunday night, I developed the cough all over again. I saw that you had a setback, right? Yeah, yeah. and I, I, was, I was concerned about it and I called my boss and she said, go back to the urgent care, get your lungs checked to make sure you don't have anything else. Um, and I did. And when I went back, the same doctor and nurse that saw me the first time were there. <laughs> and I was so grateful to see them and find out that they hadn't been infected by me. Uh -huh. And he told me that I was his first patient at that hospital. I was the first patient at that urgent care center that had it. Yeah. Um, so, so I ended up staying home another week <clears throat> just to rest. So for, for four weeks total. Um, and I have to tell you the the, uh, <laughs> there was the guilt of staying home mm -hmm. and missing being here as a leader when my team needed me. Right. And I Again, I'm so grateful that I had someone who was able to step in and, and take that leadership role for me. But then there's also the survivor guilt. Right. Because colleagues of mine died. Mm -hmm. And that was really hard. Mm -hmm. In the middle of my illness, I attended a funeral virtually for Dr. Goodrich, who mm -hmm. hired me 21 years ago. Wow. And that was really, really hard. Yeah. And having to call patients of ours that we shared from the past 20 years and tell them that he had died yeah. was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Uh -huh. So all of that emotion and fear and everything piled on top of the physical symptoms was very trying. Yeah. I feel so grateful and so blessed to be through it. And on the other side, I am fully recovered. I don't feel anything different than my normal self right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going for my antibody test right after this chat yeah. <laughs> and I will find out if I have antibodies and I'm very excited to be part of that and yeah. learn what's happening with that. Um, and since I've been back, you know, it's been, I came back at sort of the highest part of the apex right before we started to come down a little bit in New sure. York. Yeah. So I came back in the thick of it and was able to see my staff doing everything that needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we were talking about this this morning in terms of, you know, um, what are what are new things to think about in the world of child life and creative arts therapy and all the complementary therapies that roll into child life programs. And, um, you know, thinking about the value of our role and yeah 
how many different things we can do as right. child labor specialists and still feel that value, you okay. know? So our hospital, um, we have a 10 story children's hospital here. It's attached to an adult hospital. So we have 142 inpatient beds. We have about 60,000 kids a day that uh, a year rather that come through our clinics in this building. We have about 45,000 kids that come through our emergency room, our pediatric emergency room. And then we have the bigger um, part of the campus, which is the adult hospital. They have, there's about 1,500 beds total. And then we have the 11 hospitals total that are part of our healthcare system, right? So it's a very big organization in the city. Um, so in our hospital, what they did was, because all elective procedures and all surgeries and all of that was canceled, Mm -hmm. and the clinics were closed and everything like that. They cohorted all the children into specific areas and units of the hospital. And then all the other floors became adult floors. For right. COVID patients. Yeah. So, so my staff all got turned around and moved around. Um, and uh, some of them were helping on the, the pediatric floors. Some mm -hmm. of them were helping on the adult floors. Mm -hmm. um, people that normally work outpatient in day surgery or radiology um, were now helping out their colleagues in other areas. Mm -hmm. And so that meant that some of them were still doing their usual child life support of their patients, like on our HEMOC unit. Mm -hmm. All those patients were still coming in and those child life specialists were following their regular caseload and pretty much doing their usual work yeah. amidst this environment that was very, you know, scary. Yeah. yeah. Other, other people were doing things like organizing all the food donations that come in. I have one person on my staff, Kelly Garber, who is assigned to track all the food donations that come in and organize the schedule and calendar. So we make sure everybody gets what they need when they need it. Right. Um, you know, we had, she also set up a um, respite room in one of our playrooms that anybody in the hospital, any staff member could come to that had, you know, um, food, snacks, coffee, tea, um, some self-care activities to do, adult coloring, stress balls, toiletries available, lotion, lip balm, whatever. Yeah. Set that all up in that area. And that was sort of a sacred space where you could get away and rest for a minute. Um, you know, we had um, child life specialists that were bringing iPads into adult patients at end of life to connect them with their families to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. um, and not just once in a while, every day. Yeah. You know, um, and I think that what has come out of it for our team and for our hospital as a whole is an opportunity to really appreciate each other Absolutely. for what we bring to the table, all of us, mm -hmm. and to learn how to collaborate and um, really be a team. Yeah. And, and whether you're passing out food right. or preparing and supporting a patient for a procedure, both things are just as valuable during this time. Absolutely. And I think it's given a great perspective um, to the value of every component of a team. Sure. Well, that makes me at least happy to hear that, you know, in times like these, I know that there are moments of divisiveness and those that are unifying. It sounds like your team has definitely chosen to unify over it, which is awesome that everyone matters. Everyone's doing some sort of meaningful work for the better, the entire good. Um, yeah. But I am sorry to hear, I did see your post to Dr. Goodrich that, you know, you've had colleagues that have passed away. And I know you have colleagues that have joined on um, one, one of our most recent webinar panels for program leaders who has shared that uh, members of her, um, I think a physician has passed and some nursing colleagues have passed. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's kind of amazing though, when you, you know, Governor Cuomo has been talking about perspective recently and looking at the numbers with some perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, when I think about it, you know, as I said, there's about 45,000 people employed by this institution. Mm -hmm. And um, although we feel tremendous sadness over those that were lost, right. we have lost only 15. Wow. Out of wow. that many people. So yeah. um, that's, that's a blessing also. Um, you know, and in terms of our patient load, we've discharged over 4,000 um, COVID positive patients. So, so we've had successes far more than, than the losses in terms of the numbers, but the losses are still very difficult. And my team is 
struggling now with the witness that they are bearing every day to right. what's happening. You know, un, uh, similarly to other hospitals in New York City, you know, we have refrigerator trucks in our parking lot for the number of deceased people that the morgue can't handle. Um, and I, I know that sounds hard to hear, but people need to hear it. Yeah, people need right. to know that They're is the severity of what's happening here. Um, you know, there's a lot of people, naysayers out there that think this is fake or it's overblown or, um, you know, just this morning, somebody said to me, why do people use these blanket statements like a war zone? It's not a war zone. And I thought, I wish that you could come to our ED two weeks ago. Yeah, absolutely. it was definitely a war zone. And it continues to be, you know, when you when you watch those old war movies and then you see the little flaming battles here and there after the war is over, that's what's happening. Right. The battles are starting to lessen, but the war is still happening. Yeah. You know, and, and there's little pockets of battles happening here and there. And they're still hard fought and there's still people losing that battle. Mm -hmm. So we need to be mindful of that. Um, I feel like I'm the mask police now and the social distancing police because everywhere I go, I'm like, why are you not wearing your mask? You know, right. I, put, I almost put my mask on for the interview just to make it funny. <laughs> but, you know, I have to tell people, I put up a picture of myself sitting here in this office and someone who knows me said, why don't you have your mask on? <laughs> and I said, because I'm in my office alone and I can take it off in my office alone. I don't share my office with anybody. I wipe down my, my yeah. keyboard and everything when I'm done. But it, it's going to be a big social shift for Absolutely. people to learn that for the foreseeable future, this is what we need to do. And Absolutely. it is so serious, you know? Yeah.